Okay, uh, so I think we can start. So uh, thanks everyone for coming. So today we're happy to have Patrick Coles from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And uh, he's gonna tell us about prospects and challenges for Bayesian employment algorithms. So if you have any questions in the middle of the talk, uh, feel free to raise your hand or uh, ask questions in the chat. And then I can forward that to Patrick. Patrick, go ahead. All right, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about variational algorithms. This is, um, you know, sort of a hot topic right now. And anytime you have a hot topic in our field, there's always sort of lovers and haters. You know, I think everyone probably remembers some previous hot topics in our field, like quantum discord. So, and similarly with variational algorithms, you know, there's people who love them, people that hate them. And uh, the good news is that my talk will have something for everyone. Um, both for the lovers and for the haters. Uh, I'll have some good news for the, for the people who love variational algorithms. And I'll also have something for the people who don't like them. I'll talk about some challenges and some difficulties with variational algorithms. So hopefully my talk will have something for everyone. Uh, before I get into, uh, yeah, before I get into um, variational algorithms, I want to highlight that our, that Los Alamos has a quantum computing summer school. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's been a lot of fun in previous years and we're gonna host it again in 2021. So I highly encourage everyone to, con you know, who's interested to consider applying and also please do share it with people who you think might be interested. Okay, so what's a variational quantum algorithm? Um, the general structure looks like this. You have some input state rho um, that's fed into a parameterized quantum circuit or an onsatz. Um, you then measure uh, a cost function, which is basically the expectation value of some observable. And then you have a, a classical optimizer, which then updates the parameters of your parameterized gate sequence in order to try to optimize or minimize the value of your cost function. And this is the sort of generic structure. You have, of course, some cost function landscape here. And uh, it's a very flexible paradigm. Um, and that's why people like it so much is that, um, you know, we all know that programming quantum computers coming up with novel quantum algorithms can be quite hard. And so if you have a flexible paradigm that allows you to sort of program quantum computers in a task oriented way, then uh, that's very exciting because it could allow say non-experts to enter the field, it's sort of an easy model to, to program with. Um, in any case, the idea is that the different components of this, uh, of this setup um, are chosen to suit the application of interest. So you choose the onsatz, the cost function, the op and even the optimizer to suit the application that you're interested in, um, uh, you know, in, in a, in a task-oriented manner. So that's the basic idea. And uh, the most uh, famous variational quantum algorithm is, is VQE, the variational quantum eigensolver. Uh, this is based on a 2014 um, Nature Communications paper. The idea was uh, to take a Hamiltonian and expand it out in the Pauli basis. And uh, we assume that in that expansion, you only have a polynomial number of terms. That is, the, the number of terms grows efficiently in the system size. Um, and then the expectation value of the energy is just given by the linear combination of the individual expectation values of the individual terms in the expansion. And you can, of course, measure those individual terms, those Pauli operators. And, uh, and the overall algorithm looks like this. You, you, have, a, uh, you first have a parameterized gate sequence that prepares a guess at the ground state, a trial wave function, if you will. And then you measure um, those individual expectation values. You feed those to the classical computer, which you know, takes the weighted sum, computes the expectation of the energy, or alternatively, the gradient. And then, um, then you have a classical feedback loop where um, the classical optimizer chooses a new set of parameters as a better guess for the ground state. And then you re-prepare that state now with the new parameterized gate sequence. Um, and then you do it again and again in an effort to try to minimize the energy. And the idea is that in the end, you've done two things. You've found an approximate ground state energy and you've also found a gate sequence that approximately prepares uh, the ground state. So that's the most famous very uh, variational algorithm. But what this talk is going to focus on um, is uh, new frontiers on variational algorithms. And um, I'll talk about new applications that have been developed in the past, you know, say two years, like uh, solving linear systems of equations, simulating dynamics, um, machine learning applications like PCA, as well as quantum compiling. 
And I'll then talk about some more sort of fundamental results in, for variational algorithms, some good news, which is that they seem to exhibit a form of noise resilience. And then I'll talk about some more concerning or bad news um, that uh, they, to be concerned about, which is something called barren plateaus. Okay, so that's the basic outline for my talk. And uh, before I get into new applications for variational algorithms, I wanna talk about you know, what basic principles do you need to follow if you want to design a novel variational quantum algorithm. So you have some task of interest, whether that be dynamics, simulation, or linear systems, or whatever. So you have to pick a cost function based on your task, and you wanna make sure that your cost function is faithful, vanishing if and only if the task is accomplished. And then you, you also wanna make sure that non-zero values actually have some meaning. So you want to have an operational meaning for your cost so that it, it actually makes sense to try to minimize your cost to smaller and smaller values. You also wanna make sure that your cost is efficiently computable on a quantum computer, but not efficiently computable on a classical computer because otherwise it wouldn't make sense to use a quantum computer in the first place. Because that's the only thing that you use the quantum computer for is actually computing the cost. Uh, and finally, there's a subtle issue, which is that, which I'll get into later in my talk, but you wanna make sure that your cost function does not have a vanishing gradient so that the cost can actually be trained. And it turns out that certain cost functions uh, behave badly. They do have uh, small gradients, whereas other ones behave, behave nicely. Okay, so that's about the cost function. Second step is to design a short depth quantum circuit to compute your cost function. Third step, is to formulate an ansatz or a parameterized gate sequence for the solution. And finally, the last step is to choose a classical optimizer to optimize the parameters of your gate sequence. So what's nice is that we have this pretty straightforward recipe to follow for how to design novel variational algorithms. Of course, you know, one has to make sure to follow every step in this recipe. Um, but the good news is that it looks like it's not too challenging to follow this recipe. And you know, it could allow non-experts to enter the field of designing novel, novel algorithms for near-term quantum computers. So that's, that's a very nice thing. And, and I'll try to illustrate that for, with, for several applications. And the first application that I wanna talk about is solving linear systems of equations. So many people are familiar with the HHL algorithm, um, which is a quantum algorithm that provides exponential speed up for uh, solving um, the quantum linear systems problem. And uh, on the other hand, one of the downsides maybe is just that it requires a lot, both a uh, large circuit depth as well as uh, a large number of ancilla qubits. And so we came at this and said, okay, can we possibly develop a more NISC friendly, a more near term version of this sort of HHL algorithm? And just to remind you, what is the quantum linear systems problem? So you have basically AX equals B, you wanna solve for X, you basically wanna invert A um, the quantum linear systems problem is just uh, um, you actually want to prepare the solution on the quantum computer. So you want to prepare the state X that solves the linear system, or more specifically, you want to prepare a state such that AX is proportional to B, so that AX has no component orthogonal to B. So that's the goal of, of the quantum linear systems problem. And uh, you know, when we proposed our variational algorithm, we, we, we made some assumptions. We, the, one of the assumptions we made is that the input uh, to the algorithm is given in two forms. One, someone gives you the matrix A as a, as a linear combination of unitaries that can actually be implemented on a quantum computer efficiently. And then also we assume that someone gives you the unitary U that prepares the state B. So that's the input to the algorithm. And then the output of the algorithm is a gate sequence V or V of alpha, such that you've trained the parameters alpha of that gate sequence so that it prepares the state X that approximately solves that quantum linear systems problem. So uh, there's some important parameters uh, to keep in mind. Of course, as I mentioned, we, you know, you imagine that you have some variational onsides to be of alpha that you're going to train. Um, uh, so some parameters that affect the complexity of the algorithm are the condition number of A, which is the ratio of the largest to the smallest singular values of A. That tells you basically how hard it is to invert A. And then also the precision, how precise do you want your solution to be? And that'll of course affect the complexity of the algorithm. Um, and the precision could be measured say by the trace distance between the true solution and then the solution that you actually prepare. Uh, we introduce um, a cost function. One of the cost functions we consider uh, can be written simply as the expectation value of this Hamiltonian HG. And uh, you can see that identity minus the 
projector onto B is the projector orthogonal to B. And so what this Hamiltonian does, and what this cost function does, is it penalizes you whenever AX has any component orthogonal to B. So any component orthogonal to B will end up uh, leading to a non-zero value of, of your cost function. And so you can see that this is basically penalizing you whenever AX has, is not proportional to B. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the goal is not to make sure that AX is close to B. Rather, the goal is to make sure that the, the solution um, is actually close to the true solution. And so there's a big difference between those two things. And so we not want to make sure that our cost function is actually operationally meaningful. Remember I said in my list, make sure you have an operational meaning for your cost function. And sure enough, we were able to derive um, an operational meaning that whenever our cost function um, dips below a certain value, namely the value epsilon squared over kappa squared, then we can guarantee that the precision is less than epsilon. And so this is very nice because then that means you can just run your variational algorithm for as long as you need to run it and then just exit the loop as soon as you dip below the value of epsilon squared over kappa squared where epsilon is your desired precision. And then we can guarantee that as long as your cost dips below that value, you have a, you, your solution will be of the right quality. So, okay, so that's the basic idea of our algorithm. And of course we have some circuit, which I'm not gonna go into the details, but we have some circuit here that efficiently computes the cost function that, uh, that is shown here. We then, um, you know, it's very important that, to note that variational algorithms in many cases, or in most cases, um, we don't really have analytical scaling results for them, although I will talk about some scaling results later in this talk. And so we have to run numerical heuristics um, in order to get some idea for how these algorithms scale. And so in this case, we considered um, the case where A just looks kind of like an icing model. And then we add in an identity term that allows us to tune the condition number of the matrix A so we can see how the condition number affects the, the time to solution. We have some onsots, which is basically like a hardware efficient onsots here. And we have several layers of this onsots. And uh, for this example, we found um, the time to solution scales linearly with a number of qubits. Um, that's good news because, uh, you know, classical algorithms, you would typically expect the time to solution to go polynomially with the matrix dimension and hex, hence exponentially with the number of qubits. So this is what you would expect this is sort of what you would associate with an exponential speed up, similar to what is seen in the HHL algorithm. And so we, you know, at least for this toy example, we do see this kind of uh, exponential speed up. And I, I wanna emphasize that we're not cheating in this time to solution here because we, even though we run this on a classical simulator, we make sure that we, uh, we don't assume that we know the value of epsilon. We actually just use the value of our cost function to certify the value of epsilon as you would if you were running it on a quantum computer. Um, okay, so I, and I will say that we, we considered other kinds of examples. We considered random sparse uh, matrices A, and we got similar efficient scaling there. Namely, we got uh, a power law scaling, which also would you would associate with ex exponential speed up. Um, you know, we also found efficient scaling in the condition number kappa, um, as well as efficient scaling in the precision uh, epsilon, the kind of scaling that you might see from the HHL-like uh, algorithms. Um, okay, so that's our linear systems algorithm, and hopefully that illustrates the idea of how we actually build variational quantum algorithms from scratch. Um, I wanna move on to the next application, which is uh, dynamical simulation. And uh, here, uh, there's been several different approaches to variational dynamical simulation. I'll talk about the one that we've developed um, but the key idea is that, um, you know, standard methods for dynamical simulation take e to the minus iht and then break it up into small delta t chunks. Then you trotterize that, say, if you use a trotterization approach, you trotterize that delta t chunk into some gate sequence, and then you just repeat that gate sequence over and over again um, so that your, uh, you can see that your circuit depth is going to grow with the length of time that you want to simulate. And that's the concern in the NISC era because eventually you run into the coherence time of your quantum computer or the gate fidelity time. And, and then that's like a hard cutoff on how long of time you can simulate on a NISC computer. And so what we said is, look, could we possibly use um, quantum circuits whose circuit depth actually do not grow in proportion to the time that you want to simulate? And if so, then you could simulate long times uh, with the same circuit that you simulate short times with. And, and so the basic idea of our variational algorithm was to take a small time step, e to the minus i h delta t, 
and then run a variational quantum compiling algorithm that is variationally compile it into an onsatz of the form W D W dagger, where W is basically the unitary that will um, transform to the eigenbasis of this unitary, and then D is the diagonal form of the of this unitary, and then W dagger just un, untransforms it. Uh, yeah. So so then so then we we assume that we have this. Uh, so we so we. So the idea is that we assume this onsatz, and then we, var we variationally compile into this onsatz. And assuming you can do that, um, then simulating long times um, just involves the exact same circuit that you use for simulating short times. The only difference is you replace delta t with n delta t in the exponential here in the diagonal form. Um, and so that's very you know exciting because then it means that if you could do this, you could stay within the coherence time, um, and and you know. Uh, there are certain cases that allow for this. There are certain Hamiltonians that allow for this sort of what we call fast forwarding using the same circuit uh, as um, for long times as for short times. And, and just to illustrate this, we, we considered some spin chain example. Uh, and here on, on the left hand side, we're showing the, the cost function. Now, the cost function here is just quantifying basically how well have we compiled that trotter step into this onsatz WDW dagger. So it's basically measuring how good we've done that compilation. And so you can see as we minimize our cost function, we can pick it, up, pick it off at different points, red, green, blue, and purple. And then we can plot the fidelity of our simulation as a function of time. Now, if we don't minimize the cost very well, if we just do this red case, then um, we're, we're, trotterization performs better. Trotterization is just this, uh, this dash curve. Um, but then if we minimize our costs further down to say the green, the green curve, now we're starting to beat trotterization. And then the further we minimize our costs, when we get to the blue or the purple curves, and you can see that we're maintaining really high fidelities on our simulation out to extremely long times. And so we just blow trotterization away in terms of the, the quality of our simulation for long times here. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of a cool application of, of very strong algorithms for dynamical simulation. Um, the next application that I want to move on to um, is interesting from two different aspects. Uh, one is um, condensed matter physics and the other is machine learning. So if you have a quantum state rho um, and you're able to diagonalize it and extract the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that state, um, then you can use that for two things. One is you can use that to study entanglement. You know, if you have, say, a, a pure state and you do a bipartite cut and you look at the entanglement spectrum, that's very useful in condensed matter physics. It's called entanglement spectroscopy. But then in machine learning, it's also useful to do principal component analysis. And there, the idea is if you have some data set, you can form the covariance matrix. That covariance matrix is a positive semi-definite matrix. You can store that in a quantum state. And then when you're diagonalizing that state, now you're looking at the principal components of your data set. Um, and then you can do you know, principal component analysis for big data analysis. And and uh, you know, many of you might be familiar with you know, Seth Lloyd and company introduced this, this algorithm called quantum PCA to do this exact same task. And our approach was just to try to do a NISC friendly version of that because the quantum PCA once again involves uh, large circuit depth and lots of uh, ancilla qubits. Um, so our algorithm was called variation quantum state diagonalization. And the idea was, uh, to feed in a quantum state rho, or more specifically, we need two simultaneous copies of rho to evaluate our cost function. Our cost function just quantifies how big are the off-diagonal elements of this density matrix. It basically quantifies how far away you are um, in Hilbert-Schmidt distance to the uh, diagonal state. Um, and uh, the idea is that you have some unitary u that you're training in an attempt to try to diagonalize rho. So you, so you have rho, you apply your unitary u to try to diagonalize it, you then quantify the cost, which is how far away are you from being diagonal. And then uh, once you sort of minimize your cost function, you exit the loop. And now you have this unitary that you've trained that approximately diagonalizes the state rho. Um, when you apply that to rho, now the eigenvalues are in the standard basis. And so you can just do a standard basis measurement and look at the, the frequencies of your most probable, probable bit strings. And those frequencies will give you approximations of the eigenvalues. You can then take those bit strings here that you read out and then use those to uh, prepare the corresponding eigenvectors. So in the end, what you end up getting out are approximations of the largest eigenvalues and their associated eigenvectors. 
um, of your state road. Um, you know, we, we implemented this for a, a simple toy problem, diagonalizing the plus state um, on Rigetti's quantum computer. Of course, the eigenvalues are one and zero. And sure enough, you can see that as we minimize our cost function, um, then the two eigenvalues shown in blue and, yet and orange here are going to the correct values of one and zero. So we're getting the right eigenvalues. We also mapped out the cost function landscape in this bottom panel, and we get the expected cost landscape that, um, that we expect for this. Um, and finally, you know, just to illustrate a larger scale problem, um, I mentioned entanglement spectroscopy here. We just considered a Heisenberg spin chain, 12 qubits or 12 spins. We chop it in half and look at uh, a six spin reduced state and then extract the entanglement spe spectrum of that six qubit state. And then here what this plot shows is on the y axis, we, we plot the inferred eigenvalues. And on the x axis, we basically plot the inferred eigenvectors, or more specifically, a particular quantum number of the inferred eigenvectors. And so the, 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 the y-axis shows the eigenvalue accuracy, while the x-axis shows the eigenvector accuracy. And you can see that um, we get good agreement um, between the sort of theoretical and the, and the inferred eigenvalues and eigenvectors, especially for large eigenvalues. So, um, and that's by design. So our algorithm is meant to perform best on the largest eigenvalues um, and it, it, the performance gets worse for smaller eigenvalues, but that's okay because you're inter interested in the principal components anyway. Um, so you're, you're really interested in the largest eigenvalues anyway. Uh, I'll mention that more recently, um, we came out a paper with a paper that tried to make this even more NISC friendly. So you'll recall that uh, I, we required two simultaneous copies of the state row and hence two n qubits. Um, but of course, in the NISC era, we're always trying to minimize the number of qubits that we use. So uh, this algorithm, variational quantum state eigensolver, actually halves the number of qubits. So you only need n qubits, and you only need a single copy of the state row at a time. Um, and the way that we accomplished that reduction in the number of qubits is that we basically proposed a VQE-like cost function, where the cost function looks like the expectation value of some Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, how does that work? Well, it uses the connection between majorization and diagonalization. So you know that um, you know, the uh, diagonal elements of rho are majorized by its eigenvalues. And so that means that um, the eigenvalues of rho are going to lead to the most extreme value of the energy of this Hamiltonian, provided that you ensure that your Hamiltonian is non-degenerate. Um, and so you just need to make construct uh, your Hamiltonian to be non-degenerate over the space that you're interested. Namely, if, if you're interested in the five largest eigenvalues of rho, you need the five lowest energy levels of your Hamiltonian to be non-degenerate. Um, and so, so this is a very sort of NISC-friendly version of this uh, um, state diagonalization. And um, yeah, so, so, so that's the basic idea. Uh, okay, so I've gone through several applications um, of variational algorithms. And um, I'm going to talk about one more application uh, called quantum compiling. And, but this application is really going to help me to illustrate um, a general phenomenon, or what we think is a general phenomenon for variational algorithms uh, called noise resilience. So let me just talk about um, this last application, quantum compiling. Um, and here the idea is that suppose you have some gate sequence u or some unitary u, and you want to compile it down to some short depth gate sequence. So maybe u happens to be really long and you want to reduce the circuit depth down to something shorter, and you're okay if it's just an approximate version of the original unitary. Uh, and so what you're going to do is that you're going to have an onsatz V, V of alpha, and you're going to be frugal with your onsatz. You're going to keep the onsatz short depth, and, uh, and then you're just going to try to make V close, as close as possible to the unitary U. And so then your cost function is just going to be something like an inner product or Hilbert-Schmidt inner product, say, that's what we used here, between the target unitary u and your onsatz v. And sure enough, the circuit that I show here on the slide actually computes the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product between u and v. And so you're just going to um, optimize the parameters of v to try to maximize the, cl the closeness of, uh, of v with u. And then the output will be some sort of short depth approximate version of the original unitary u. And that's what we call variational quantum compiling. Now, um, what was really interesting, when, when we actually ran our variational quantum compiling algorithm on IBM's uh, noisy simulator, um, this is the kind of thing that we got. So we ran this, and the, the red curves here in these plots, these, these plots are shown for different numbers of qubits, but anyway, just focus on the red curve, 
And you can see that the red curve, which is the noisy cost, does not actually go to zero. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, that's unfortunate. It's not really training. It's not really working because the cost function isn't going to zero. Ah, but what if we take the parameters that you learned during this optimization and then evaluate uh, what the cost would have been if it was a noise-free quantum computer? And what you get is the green curve. And you can see in every one of these plots, the green curve goes all the way to zero there, there. And every, every case, the green curve always goes to zero. So this is fascinating because what it seems to mean is that even though the noisy cost function is going to zero, somehow we're still learning the correct optimal parameters of our unitary. Um, so what would that actually look like in terms of a cost landscape? Well, maybe this is your noise-free cost landscape and it looks something like this. Um, and then when you throw in noise, then of course the cost landscape will be affected. In the, but the way that we expect it to be affected is that you basically shrink it in the vertical direction, you kind of compress it. Um, but it doesn't appear to shift left or right in parameter space. So the original global minimum, which appeared here, aligns perfectly with the, uh, the global minimum of the noisy case. Um, so that's the basic idea of what seems to be going on here. It looks like noise does not affect the optimal unitary that you extract uh, from this variational quantum compiling algorithm. And that's actually really good news for the NISC era because it means that, you know, the goal of this variational quantum compiling was to compress the depth and hence try to remove noise. And, it, uh, but you might be concerned that noise somehow shows up uh, or is compiled into your final solution. Um, but it turns out that's actually not the case. And so you can actually use this to remove noise uh, from algorithms. And so, and the noise doesn't appear to show up in your final, in your final uh, thing that you've compiled. Uh, that was just some, some uh, you know, numerics that I showed you, but we, we actually investigated this analytically um, in a whole paper, and it turns out you can actually prove theorems. You can rigorously prove noise resilience, um, at least in this case for variational quantum compiling. And so we considered several different noise models acting during the, the cost evaluation circuit. DN stands for depolarizing noise. MN is measurement noise. PGN is polygate noise. So we considered a whole bunch of different noise processes that could possibly act during this circuit. And for all of this complicated uh, noise model, we were able to prove that um, the global minimum is completely unaffected uh, by uh, the presence of this, of this noise. Um, and we went a step further, you know, because we want to make sure that this is actually something really um, general and it goes beyond this, the noise model that we considered on the previous slide. We actually considered IBM's noisy simulator for uh, while compiling these three qubit gates we compiled the Toffley gate and the W state preparation. And um, in both cases, we saw about three orders of magnitude of noise resilience. That is, even though the, no the noise, the noisy cost function was only getting down to like five times 10 to the minus one, then the noise free cost function was going down very far. It was going down to like 10 to the minus three or sometimes 10 to the minus four as well. Um, so we think that this is actually a, a, the real deal that we do have this noise resilience for realistic noise models. Um, and anecdotally, I'll mention that we have seen it in other contexts. We've seen it in our linear systems algorithm. We've seen it in our dynamics algorithm. And you, people are saying that they've seen it in the context of VQE. Um, so we think that there's some really interesting thing going on here with, with this noise resilience. Okay, so I'm at the halfway point for my talk. Um, and I've covered basically the good news part of my talk. And then the second half of my talk is basically the bad news. So I thought I would sort of pause at this point and see if there's any questions um, on, the, uh, on the first half of my talk. Right, so there was a question. Um, does the training of VQC have a barren plateau if issue? I guess it's more about yeah. the second part, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good question. Um, and um, so, yeah, the... Uh, there is a cost function dependent barren plateau that I will get into in the second half of my talk. And I'll talk about actually two different barren plateau issues. One is what I'll call a shallow depth barren plateau, and the other is a deep depth barren plateau. So the deep depth barren plateau is going to affect you know, almost every variational algorithm unless you really have a very clear notion of an onsat. Um, but the shallow depth barren plateau is something that you can actually address, um, and that's due to um, global cost functions, and I'll get into that in the second part of my talk. 
Um, but so if you do use the Hilbert Schmidt product, and I kind of glossed over this, um, then you actually will run into a shallow depth barren plateau. And so that's why we actually end up using um, we end up using a, a local version of the Hilbert Schmidt test where you actually compare um, you know, how close things are in a local sense, qubit by qubit. Um, I realize that's kind of a subtle answer, uh, but what, I'll, what I'm trying to say is that you can get rid of the shallow depth barren plateau. That's easily addressable. Um, the deep depth one is more complicated. And um, yeah, so that, that's another topic, but yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, Patrick, we, we have uh, one more question. Maybe we, we can answer that and go to the next one. Uh, so in normal uh, quantum linear, uh, systems of linear equation algorithm, the error dependence is you know, polylogarithmic. But if I understand correctly from your slide, the dependence on the error and the variation approach for inverting a linear system is uh, probably one over epsilon square. Do you think this can be improved? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think you're referring to probably the fact that um, you know our, our certification procedure involves involves that that factor. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not aware of. Uh, well, okay, it's something we're thinking about, um, but uh, I'm not yet aware of that solution um, of a solution to that to that problem. But that's a really good question. Um, and uh, yeah, future work. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you can move on to the next part of the okay, talk. Good. All right, yeah, so I'll move on to the second half of the talk, which is on um, barren plateaus. So, and I'm gonna talk about like two different kind of barren plateaus. One are what I'll call barren plateaus due to ignorance or lack of knowledge, where you just don't have a lot of prior knowledge about the solution to the problem. And then another one is barren plateaus uh, due to noise. And these are qualitatively different phenomena, and I'll get into why they're qualitatively different. Um, so there was this pioneering paper in 2018 by the Google group uh, called Barren Plateaus in Quantum Neural Network Training Landscapes. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so what this paper did is they, they basically considered um, an odds-odds U, U of theta, and then they honed in on say one parameter, theta sub k, and then they asked, you know, what is the partial derivative with respect to um, theta sub k for this cost function, and how does that partial derivative scale with the number of qubits. Um, and they, can, they called u, u minus and u plus the ons to the left and the ons to the right of that, uh, of that gate of interest, right? So we're looking at this partial derivative here and we wanna know how does that scale with the number of qubits? And here's what they found. Um, they found that if either u plus or u minus, either the ons to the left or the ons to the right, forms called a two design, um, then, the variance of the partial derivative uh, decays exponentially with the number of qubits. Now, why, why are we interested in the variance? Well, the first moment of the, par of the partial derivative actually vanishes, and that's just a statement to say that your gradient is unbiased with respect to positive and negative values. Um, so the first moment isn't really interesting, um, but if the variance decays exponentially with the number of qubits, then that means that your, your gradient is exponentially concentrating around the value of zero as you increase the number of qubits. And uh, so what that corresponds to is a landscape that kind of looks like this. Now, it doesn't mean that the gradient is zero everywhere. Um, it just means that probabilistically, the gradient is, is very small. And so if you randomly pick points on this landscape, of course, there's some chance that you might get a large gradient, but probabilistically, the chance of that is very small. And with high probability, you actually end up in this flat region. So that means that if you randomly initialize your odds odds, then chances are you're gonna end up in this really flat region of the landscape that we call the barren plateau. Okay, so it's a, so it's a probabilistic statement. Um, and, uh, but I also like to view the barren plateau result as a complexity theoretic result because barren plateaus essentially apply, imply that your algorithm will have exponential scaling. And obviously we're trying to avoid exponential scaling for quantum algorithms uh, because we're trying to get exponential speed up, say over classical algorithms. Um, and we can see that um, in this plot here. Um, this is from a recent paper that just came out this month from our group. Uh, we consider both gradient descent and, and gradient free optimizers. And of course you would expect that gradient based optimizers would be affected. The idea is that if you have a small gradient, then you're gonna need a higher precision 
that is more shots to characterize that gradient. So the y-axis here corresponds to the number of shots that you need in order to basically escape the barren plateau or start to train your cost function. And what we found is that the number of shots that you need to escape the barren plateau is growing exponentially in the number of qubits uh, for gradient descent, but it also grows exponentially in the number of qubits for gradient free optimizers. So Nelder, Mead, Powell, Kobilla, these are all gradient free optimizers. And um, so how do you understand that? Well, we, we had some proposition that basically said that, um, you know, if your if your gradient vanishes, then also cost function differences will also vanish in your landscape. And you know, gradient free optimizers use cost function differences in order to make decisions for how to proceed in the optimization. And so you can also show that with high probability, if you randomly pick points on the landscape, cost function differences are also going to be exponentially suppressed as well. And that's why gradient free optimizers are affected as well. And sure enough, you can also extend this to other kinds of optimizers, optimizers that use higher order derivatives like Hessian based optimizers, you might say, oh, well, maybe I can get around this problem by using the Hessian. But you can also show that in another paper that we had in August, that, um, that uh, if you have a barren plateau, then your matrix elements of your Hessian and higher order derivatives will also be exponentially suppressed. And hence you'll also need exponential precision to characterize those, those, those quantities. Um, and so, so we like to view the barren plateau phenomenon as a complexity theoretic result um, because it, it affects the scaling of your algorithm. And um, you know, so, so, so thus far I've talked about largely the Google Baron Plateau result, which is a result for um, deep onsatzes. And um, our group um, came at this problem and we asked, could we possibly extend the Baron Plateau phenomenon to shallow depth quantum circuits? And what we found is that the answer is yes, if we allow this phenomenon to depend on the cost function. And I alluded to this in my answer to the question that someone asked earlier about variational quantum compiling, but um, I want to, okay, so this is basically the title of our, um, our paper. It's called Cost Function Dependent Barren Plateaus in Shallow Quantum Neural Networks. Note the keyword here is shallow. So, um, and of course the other keyword is cost function dependent. So I wanna give you some intuition for how uh, barren plateaus could be cost function dependent. So here, let me consider a toy model where the goal is to just try to prepare the zero state from the zero state. So you're literally just trying to learn the identity gate here. It's one of the simplest you know, toy models you can construct. And um, you, could construct, you could construct a, a global, what we call a global cost function, CG here, where the idea is that you just penalize yourself for being orthogonal to the zero state. It's very intuitive. You would expect, you know, this is kind of what you would first guess at a cost function. Just penalize yourself for being orthogonal to the zero state. Um, so you put here the projector orthogonal to the zero state and you look at the overlap with that projector. That's what we call a global cost function. Um, and what we, on the other hand, you could have a local cost function that uh, penalizes you for being locally orthogonal. So orthogonal to the local zero state on each individual qubit and then you sum up all of the individual uh, terms from, from, for all, all the qubits. Okay, so if you had a global cost function or a local cost function and you plotted the cost function landscape, this is what you would get. So for the global cost function, um, you know, if you, here we just consider the tensor product onsatz, and then you look at how it depends on the parameters of that onsatz, you get a product of terms. So notice that this is a product from j equals one to n, and whenever you have a product of terms that are less than one, then that's basically exponential decay in the number of qubits. And so sure enough, you can see that the blue landscape corresponds to having a small number of qubits. And then as we increase the number of qubits, we get this orange landscape. And we're seeing two phenomena here. One is that um, the valley containing the global minimum is narrowing. We actually call that the narrow gorge phenomenon because it's actually exponentially narrowing. Um, and then the other phenomenon is what you might call the barren plateau phenomenon which is that um, the flat region is getting more flat. Uh, and so if you randomly pick points, um, you get these black points. If you randomly pick points, then you'll find that most of those points will end up in the flat region and only a small number of those points actually um, show up in the valley containing global minimum. In contrast, if you look at the local cost function landscape, this is actually a two dimensional cross section of the landscape and it's actually invariant for the local cost function as you increase the number of qubits. And, uh, and you can see that um, 
as you, when you randomly pick points with very high probability, these points, points end up in the valley containing the global minimum. And so you don't have this narrow gorge effect anymore. Okay, so that's a, basically a simple toy model of, uh, of, this, barren, of this cost function dependent barren plateau. Um, but we wanted to have a, a general analytic result. So we considered a general situation where you have uh, this sort of hardware efficient onsets with nearest neighbor um, gates. And we assumed that each of these uh, blocks forms a local two design. That's the key assumption of our theorem. Um, and then we had some generalized global cost function involving terms that act non-trivially on every single qubit. Um, that's what we consider as global. And then for local cost functions, um, we just involve local terms, basically nearest neighbor kind of terms here. Um, okay, so we consider this sort of generalized global cost function and a generalized local cost function. And then our main result is, is twofold. The first part of our main result is to say that if you consider shallow depth circuits, then for a global cost function, you will always have a barren plateau. In contrast, if you consider shallow depth circuits, for the local cost function, that is say if the depth is order log n, then, uh, then the variance of the partial derivative will at worst vanish polynomially in the number of qubits. And that's good because that only means that you have polynomial overhead that characterized your, your gradient. So what does that look like if we were to summarize it in a picture? Here, um, red means sort of untrainable or barren plateau, uh, and green means trainable or a polynomial vanishing gradient. Yellow is kind of a transition region. This is our, the summary of our results. And then we combine, when we combine it with the, uh, with the Google results, then we can go all the way from sort of order one depth all the way to order poly n depth. And we can see that global cost functions are just bad news, right? Because these guys have, are like basically untrainable everywhere for all depths, it's for shallow depth and for deep depth. So you know, never use a global cost function. In contrast, local cost functions are actually trainable provided your circuit depth is not too deep. So we have trainable, this trainable region for log n depth, and then eventually we get to the barren plateau when we go deep enough. And we can actually see this result sort of play out. For an example, we consider the quantum autoencoder, uh, which is a well-known variational quantum algorithm. And we just consider two different cost functions, a global cost function and a local cost function. And I will mention that both of these cost functions are faithful, they vanish under the same conditions. And, and so the local cost function is, le is a legit cost function. Um, and what, but we find very different behavior, right? So as we increase the number of qubits from 10 all the way up to 100, we see that whenever we hit 20 qubits, the global cost function is starting to struggle. And as soon as we go beyond 20 qubits, the global cost function doesn't train at all. It just stays completely flat. And, and, and it takes that behavior all the way up to 100 qubits. In contrast, the local cost function is training, 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 training. We were able to train it all the way up to 100 qubits, which is as large as we considered. And so that's very encouraging. It looks like these local cost functions seem to uh, be a good way of indirectly training the global cost function. So instead of directly training the global cost function, you should directly train the local cost function, which indirectly trains the global cost function. Okay, that's the idea of, of our work. And uh, you know, the, the group in Moscow, um, kind of verified our work in a, in a, in a different context. Uh, they considered a fermionic simulation. So anytime you want to simulate a fermionic system, the first step is to do a fermion to qubit mapping. And you have some options there for how to do that mapping. You could use Jordan Wigner, you can use Bravi Kataev. And these different options have significantly different effects on the trainability. It's known that the Jordan Wigner transformation tends to lead to more sort of global terms or non-local terms. And sure enough, you see with that transformation, they found that you get a barren plateau for shallow depth, whereas with the bravi kataev transformation, which is known to lead to more local terms, local poly terms, you actually do not have this barren plateau for shallow depth. So this is like a really cool illustration of this cost function dependent barren plateau phenomenon, which has very practical implications because many people are really interested in fermionic simulations. I'll just, I'll just briefly mention that we've extended this to other kinds of onsets, so it's not just this um, onsets that I showed you. We also considered perceptron-based quantum neural networks. We've seen the same phenomenon occur there. Um, and I'll also mention that uh, we've, we've even seen this for different kinds of cost functions, like uh, if you want to do Hamiltonian diagonalization for dynamics, we found that uh, we were able to show that our cost function um, has polynomially vanishing gradients as long as your Hamiltonian that you're trying to diagonalize 
is actually a local Hamiltonian. So, so we see this phenomenon show up in different contexts. So it looks like it's, it's a, some sort of interesting and general connection between locality and trainability. Okay, finally, I'll move on to the very last topic of my talk, uh, which is barren plateaus due to noise. And uh, this is a recent paper that uh, just came out uh, in July. And uh, the idea here was we actually went really general with our onsots. We, we considered on any onsots that you could break up into layers such that you have local noise acting both before and after each layer, right? So I have a no local noise channels acting before the layer and local noise acting after the layer. And, uh, and the kind of local noise that we considered um, includes uh, depolarizing noise and more generally it's basically a polychannel. Um, and uh, we, we, the key parameter here is Q. Q um, tells you basically the shrinking factor for the least noisy axis. And so if the z-axis is the least noisy axis, then Q tells you the shrinking factor, the block sphere in that, uh, along that direction. Okay, so that's the setting of our result. And then finally, our main result was to show that the, the cost function partial derivative vanishes exponentially in the number of qubits. Um, and note that this is a general result for pretty much any onsots, um, provided that your circuit depth L scales sufficiently quickly with the number of qubits. Now, um, what does sufficiently quickly mean? Well, uh, if basically you can see that the right-hand side is a linear function of N, the number of qubits. And so if L scales super linearly with N, then you automatically satisfy this condition. If L scales linearly with N, then you sometimes satisfy this condition when the noise Q exceeds some threshold. And so for this can affect circuits that scale either linearly or super linearly in the number of uh, qubits. And, um, and where does this phenomenon come from? Well, you can, we sort of like to illustrate it with this picture here. As you um, increase the problem size, you correspondingly tend to increase the depth of your circuit. And what that does to the cost landscape is that it, it shrinks it in the vertical direction. So the cost landscape uh, goes from having sort of a deep valley like this to having a very shallow valley like this. And so what you're basically getting is that the cost function itself uh, concentrates around the cost value for the maximum mix state, which is this here. And so you can, you can actually prove that the cost value exponentially concentrates around the value for the maximum mix state. And as a corollary of that, the, the partial derivative is then uh, vanishing exponentially. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the idea for where this comes from. And um, so it's an exponential flattening of the entire cost landscape. It's no longer a probabilistic statement. So remember the other barren plateau phenomenon was actually probabilistic. This is actually deterministic. The entire landscape flattens. And um, it's inevitable if you have super linear depth and it occurs if the circuit depth is linear and the noise is above some threshold. And we haven't made any assumptions about parameter initialization or locality of the cost function. Um, this has implications, for example, for QAWA and VQE. Um, QAWA stands for Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm. That's uh, an algorithm that's very popular for solving combinatorial optimization problems. And uh, it's known that in QAWA problems that um, you, can, you can have, the, the circuit depth can grow in two ways. One is that the number of QAWA rounds, P, can actually grow with the number of qubits. And then another one is that the compilation cost for a single round of QAWA can actually grow with the number of qubits. So there's actually two ways that you could end up running into a noise-induced barren plateau in the context of Quawa. And then similarly, in, in VQE, um, the unitary coupled cluster onsatz UCC, is also expected to have sort of a polynomial depth and is also expected to run into this issue. Um, and so we actually looked at this numerically. We simulated Quawa, um, and uh, we looked to see how the, the gradient basically scales with the, number of, uh, with the number of layers, in this case, number of rounds. Um, and we, we found exponential decay of the gradient with the number of layers, which would then, of course, turn into exponential decay with the number of qubits if the layers scaled with the number of qubits. Um, so, so in the noise-free case, the gradient basically stays flat with the number of layers, whereas in the noisy case, it actually uh, decays with the number of layers. And this significantly affects the training and the performance. So the, the top panel here shows the, the overall performance of the algorithm. And you can see as you increase the number of layers, 
the performance is doing better and better in the noise-free case, but it's actually doing worse and worse in the noisy case. So actually adding layers can actually hurt you in, in, in Quawa if you have noise. Okay, so just to summarize the noise-induced barren plateau, it's conceptually different from noise-free barren plateaus and it occurs irrespective of these strategies that people sometimes use to avoid barren plateaus like pre-training, initialization, cost function locality, or parameter correla correlation. And so there's you know, questions of how do we actually avoid it? Um, you know, certainly reducing the circuit depth or reducing the noise level could be ways uh, to avoid this. And so, so hence this um, hi highlights the need to keep your circuit depth shallow for various algorithms. And, um, you know, and there's some sort of fun little picture that we show here uh, that shows the trade-off for various algorithms, you know, increasing the depth and increasing the noise and how you can run into uh, problems um, when you do that. So last slide, uh, just to summarize, variational quantum algorithms are really exciting because they uh, offer task-oriented programming of, of quantum computers. And we all know that task-oriented programming has revolutionized class compu classical computing. So could we do the same for quantum computers? Uh, we'll find out. Um, designing VQAs is not too difficult could allow non-experts to enter the field. Um, and the good news is that they exhibit a surprising form of noise resilience, but the concerning news is of course to watch out for, uh, for barren plateaus. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And I look forward to taking any questions you might have. Okay, thanks Patrick for a very nice talk. Uh, let me, while I'm waiting for some questions. Uh, I had one minor question about the uh, uh, noise-induced barren plateau. Uh, I was wondering uh, what the precise model was uh, with these like slices of unitaries. Uh, is that like a depth one circuit or um, or, or something else? So oh. there, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we didn't really we didn't assume anything about the form of these um, the form of these uh, unitaries here. Um, in the layers, so it's 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 a general result, um, and uh, so we didn't get into the details of like the depth of them. Um, one thing you might ask is how many parameters are in that uh, you know in that layer, and we allow there to be a vector of parameters here. Um, so so then you know we we do um, allow for many like there to be many parameters, but we also allow for and this is maybe you know, important in the context of Quawa, we also allow for parameter correlation, actually. So, uh, because in the context of Quawa, you might have, say, one parameter per layer, but that when you actually compile it into a native gate sequence, mm -hmm. a native gate set, then that parameter shows up many times. Um, and so then, uh, you know, our result even holds, we, we, well, we had to extend it, of course, but we, we managed to extend it to the case where your parameters are correlated, correlated as well. Um, so, so we think it's a pretty general result, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Okay, yeah. so I, I have some questions. So the first question is in the chat. So from Elijah. So I missed the first part of the talk, but uh, if not covered already, could you speak to initialization, initialization strategies and their relation to say classical initialization strategies to deal with vanishing gradients? Yeah, initially, initialization strategies, I mean, obviously, they're not going to address this noise-induced barren plateau issue, but for the noise-free barren plateaus, they look quite promising. Um, there's been several different proposals for this. Um, some people have proposed to classically train first. I think the Google group did that. Um, you know, you, use a classical methods to pre-train, and then uh, for initialization of the, of the BQA. Um, there's also other initialization strategies. Some people have proposed to do layer-wise training. Um, and another one is to initialize to the identity. So a group has proposed to um, basically uh, take some sort of, uh, you know, portions of the onsots and in initialize those to the identity. And, uh, and then, uh, which kind of effectively reduces the depth of your circuit. Um, and they found nice results there. Um, I think we need a lot more study into this. And I personally feel that for variational quantum algorithms, you know, methods to avoid barren plateaus is, you know, one of the most important research directions. Um, so, you know, we need more. The other thing that we don't really have is we don't really have analytical um, guarantees that some of these strategies will work. Um, we have some numerical heuristics. Um, 
but uh, we don't. We were still. We still need more analytical results there. So, so I guess my answer is that yes, there are some interesting initialization strategies that look really promising from the heuristic side, and we need more investigation into how they work in general. Um, okay. Here's, this is a question from Yutaka Shikano. So when we use the real quantum computing device, the noise level is changing hourly, I'm guessing continuously, and such time varying noise during the long run of the QAOA or VQE onsets, how do you set the noise level in your analysis? Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously our analysis was, um, you know, for, for a sort of time independent noise model there. And um, I suppose that there might be a way to mock up a sort of effective noise model for time varying noise that's uh, somehow, uh, you know, like, like some that you can sort of, because you're taking statistics that it sort of ends up being an average noise model over time. Um, but that's an interesting question and I haven't thought too much about it. Um, and, um, you know, but, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, obviously you can consider all kinds of crazy noise models. Um, I, I still think that this noise induced burn plateau will probably, you know, extend in some way if we want to consider that result. I don't know if you were referring to my noise induced barren plateau result or the noise resilience stuff. Uh, but I was, okay, I answered it for the noise induced barren plateau case, but, uh, uh, the noise resilience is obviously more complicated. Uh, well, okay. The noise resilience, I don't know the answer if we can show noise resilience under time varying noise models. So I don't know. Good question. Yeah, lots to, lots to investigate. Yeah. Um, one more question is from Alessandro Longo. Um, I'd like to know if you're aware of any lower bound on the circuit depths for some problem in the variational setting. Maybe for combinatorial optimization, Quawa, we need at least, let's say, k layers of variational on such, which might be bigger than the maximum depth allowed for barren plateaus. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there are some results like this. Um, you know, I could probably just sp spend a couple minutes and find references that answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I, there's been quite a lot of work on Quawa. Um, and, uh, and I, that's one of the few, you know, algorithms that people have really made significant progress on uh, analytically. Um, and so I'm pretty sure that there are answers to that, but I don't really have the reference offhand. I could try to find it and then maybe paste it in some chat window um, later on. Uh, but I think that there are some, uh, oh, but actually, what am I talking about? So I think I actually have a slide on this. Because um, I, yeah, I, I had a slide on Quawa that- uh, The tasting sent Bravi slide. Yeah, yeah, I had a slide on this. So, um, uh, yeah, so there it is, this one. Okay, so there, here, here, it's right here. So this is the slide. Um, I don't know why this slipped my mind, but anyway, yeah, this slide says that, uh, yeah, generic problems can run, have the potential to, so the compilation overhead itself, just the compilation overhead itself for a single round is expected to be order N, like linear, linear depth. So, so you could just be killed just by compilation overhead. Um, but then in addition to that, in some cases, the number of rounds may need to grow with N2. And then that's where this Bravi, Wang, Hastings results. So, so these, these are the papers. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so the answer is, there you go, this slide. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, there was a related question by the same person. Um, like, are there I'm guessing the question is this, uh, you can correct me if I'm phrasing it incorrectly, but are there like lower bounds on the circuit depths for being non-classically uh, uh, classically simulable or non-classically simulable that you are aware uh, of? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know. Do you know Isaac? <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> no. <laughs> I was hoping yeah. you would answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, once again, I will. Oh. Um, oh yeah. 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 Wait. Wait. Wait a second. No. 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 There's a reference by. Um, no. No. There's this guy, uh, uh, Gavin Crooks. So Gavin Crooks has a paper 
that uh, um, looks at uh, this max cut problem. And he, his, his max cut, this max cut thing, he's looking at the approximation ratio and he makes a plot kind of similar to this um, plot that I show here. He plots approximation ratio versus P and, and then he has some classical algorithm and he shows that whenever you know, P exceeds some threshold, then, uh, then, then like, um, you can beat the classical algorithm. Like the best classical algorithm is known to have an approximation ratio that like can't exceed something like 0.94 or something. I won't get the number right, but there's some line here on this plot that's like around 0.94 or something like that that's like impossible to beat classically. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that the quantum is beating it. Um, so yes, there is this paper by Gavin Crooks about the performance of max cut um, that, that answers that question. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick, for your talk. Really impressive results. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to hear that. Um, I think we can end with one final question. So there was one next one, one question from Elijah. So circuit depth in classical ML is occasionally parameterized, parameterized as a hyperparameter, which is itself learnable by an extended network. Have circuit depth parameters themselves been trained as part of VQA models that you know of? <clears throat> Have circuit depth parameters themselves been trained as part of VQA models? Circuit depth parameters. Oh, you're saying that make the circuit depth itself as a variational parameter? So like, like vary the circuit depth? Yes. In the yes. optimization. Sorry. Right? Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I mean, we've done that in our numerical heuristics, and it and it's a good idea to do. Um, and th this is like variable ansatz approach. Um, and I think more and more people should consider moving towards like variable ansatz methods because you want to be as frugal as possible in the circuit depth. Um, and I have seen papers, I know that Minshu has a paper on sort of variable architecture stuff. Um, and uh, I've seen some other papers as well. There's like ADAPT VQE, uh, but adaptive approaches to, to ansatzes looks like a really interesting and good strategy uh, to try to keep things shallow depth. So yeah. Okay. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I think that'll be it. Uh, thanks again uh, a lot for a great talk. I'm okay. Pretty, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. And, thanks for having uh, me. Okay. Let's see. So, any um, so in, any uh, announcements from the organizer, maybe Minsu, before I end this? No, no. I think uh, that will be it. Okay. We will have a session break for one hour, and then we will continue. Is the next time uh, you might be talk. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's nice seeing you guys. Bye bye. Thanks.